last 30 years, the forces of autocracy have been The Russian army is committing barbaric actions. Welcome to our next question and answer episode on understanding the war. And today we're going to be dealing with one of the most important elements of the war, namely energy. Uh, and we'll be speaking with the person I call the grand old man of uh, energy in Europe, Professor Jean-Michel Glachon, uh, who has been studying, working with both the academic and practical side uh, of this important field. So warmly welcome, Jean-Michel. It's lovely to have you here today. My pleasure. Very great. Now, um, you've been dealing with issues relating to energy, say oil, uh, gas, you name it. Uh, when the war began, what were your sort of first sentiments? What, what did you think was going to happen? I didn't know. The only thing I noticed is that it was not a war in Ukraine, which can seem stupid, but it was a war in geopolitics to make geopolitical changes absolutely certain, impossible to change again. So this was beyond my capability to think, and I was entering into something totally unknown, but forever, I may say, for decades. That's exactly what I thought. And I, w I didn't know if we were able to have sanctions, but sanctions quickly showed that we answered the way the war was triggered, and then it became a change of the world. And energy doesn't like geopolitical changes. Energy likes something more stable. And the thing is, isn't it, that you know, energy is nowadays very much used as a weapon. I mean, in a world where everything can be weaponized, you can use it as an instrument. Did you ever feel that, you know, Europe was in a spot of trouble because of our energy dependency on, on Russia? Or did you see it as a good link of sort of integrating Russia into the West? What, what's your sentiment on that now? I was following the trends being that trade brings peace. And... Uh, I was sold since the Cold War, that we had the Cold War and trade, and I was buying it. But uh, as you have seen, in a bilateral relations, we are two, not one. And the other side shows something else, and we are in this something else. We were not prepared. And everything we did, investment, technological choices, etc., etc., we are made according to this feeling that we will get peace forever. But, by the way, we have the same type of relation with China. We bank that cooperation with China is forever, because we are linked to the manufacturing side of China, so we need their components and, and they need to sell them to us. But, again, it's a bilateral relation, what is the other side willing for the future? Did you ever expect the European Union to be so quick and so determined and so united in, in pushing the sanctions? I mean, of course, first there was coal. Then, right now, there's big talk about oil. And then the next one in the line is, is gas. So did you expect this to go faster, slower? Is Europe doing the right thing at the moment? Stupidly, as we were still in the pandemic, I was thinking relations between the countries are good. And we, we need the US to do the military organization, the military fight. So nobody will defect when we have the US pushing. And we are still in the pandemic with this good mood showing that together we can do things. So I'm not being so surprised. Oh, it's good to hear, and, and this is, I mean, you know, my mentality is very much the same. I always felt that interdependency is actually a good thing, because at the end of the day, you become so interdependent that you can't detach it anymore. But of course, Europe, to a certain extent, you could say, has been naive on two accounts. One was to be dependent on Russian oil, 
and gas. And the other one was to be dependent on American security. And to a certain extent, you know, that balance is, is, is changing at the moment. I think American security will still be there, but the Russian energy is, is probably not. So let's say if you were a European dictator now and you were sitting in the European Council, what, what would be your recommendation, uh, you know, as, as the grand old man of energy? What should we do with Russia? I would do put a strong tax both on oil and, and gas because uh, I think we are not ready for an embargo. Several countries are not ready for, for an embargo. And it's not a view that we can succeed having an embargo working before, say, two years. And two years is very long. And we have seen that uh, the, the price tool can, can have real, real impact on what we do and what the Russians can get from us. And so I understand as a humble political scientist, so that would basically mean that you put a tax on whatever you import from Russia. Yeah. And that means that de facto they lose the money that they get from the price hike that we're paying at the moment. Is that yes. how it works roughly? Exactly, yes. Okay. And then, so how from now on, you know, we have of course sanctioned coal, uh, you know, oil and gas uh, are on the way out. How do you think this will help what we call the green transition in Europe? Are you sort of an optimist or pessimist on this? Will this push the green deal or fit for 55 a little bit faster or will this slow things down? I'm not optimistic, I'm only realistic, Alex. We have no other way to make it good. The only way we have to be really independent and to have a vibrant economy, because uh, we, have, we, have, we, we, we have the duty of delivering affordable energy to the consumers and to the industry. It's the only way. Mm. So this does not change. What is changing is the speed and the practicalities. Mm -hmm. The speed, because we would like to accelerate, but at the same moment, the consumers are feeling the heat of the prices and it's unclear if we can simultaneously accelerate transition and uh, giving uh, a wave to citizens to absorb this uh, energy shock. And second, the real, the, the, what I was saying about international chain, supply chain, is absolutely true also for energy transition. We made two big assumptions in the EU. Russia will give us fossil fuels, and China and China-like countries will give us the components, the raw materials mm. for our energy transition. This has to be rethink. We have already seen that we have shortage of material for offshore wind, and uh, the company Siemens Gamesa is really in trouble. We have also seen in several uh, the country, the Czech Republic, that we have also a shortage of solar panels, and sometimes we have shortage of heat pumps, and sometimes we have shortage of manpower, because nobody was trained to deliver a faster transition. And this has been seen by European Commission in his last uh, orientation, being a repower EU, but was not foreseen in Fit for 55. The, the, doc we, the DOC Commission released in July 2021 was assuming that Russia was on our side, that the energy shock is for some months, and that, of, of mm. course, the supply chain will feed our energy transition. All of this has to be looked at again, to be reviewed, and it is started in this DOC called Repower EU uh, issued the uh, 18th of May with several annexes. Yeah, and this is the, I think, really interesting thing is to see how it really impacts the whole transition. I remember, you know, Mario Draghi, the Prime Minister of Italy, he, he, he said it very well. He said, it, well, all of us consumers and human beings have a choice. Do we want peace? or air conditioning. <laughs> and to all of our listeners and viewers here today, you should know that there is no air conditioning in this office and it is actually quite hot as well. Now, do, do you see, you know, because disruption always leads to change and, and, you know, energy is very much at the center of climate change. And we keep on arguing that you need three things. One is 
regulation. You're like a superstar on that and you organize a lot of training on energy regulation and what it looks like. Second, finance, which you work on a, a lot as, as well. And three, innovation. Do you think that at the end of this energy crisis of sorts in Europe, we actually end up having a real European energy union or are we still so jealous about our own energy that we're not going to share it? What, what's your take on this? Regarding <laughs> innovation and finance, mm. we are very near to get it. Mm. It's not full speed, but we are very near to get it. Regarding rules, we are still away from... European or global? European. Okay. The European rules, because tradition in EU is to have common targets, national policies. Mm. And this is very difficult when you, when you say, like Commission is saying these days, and several countries, if you put an enormous effort on wind offshore, Belgium, the, the Netherlands, Denmark and Germany, where is this electricity to go? Because mm. we do not have the transmission lines yeah. to make this electricity moving. Commission is also saying 600 gigawatt of solar. Well, welcome, but the same. Are we ready? Do we have mm. the transmission really? lines? Do we have yeah. the rules? Do we have the cross-border accessibility? For example, Spain, wonderful country for sun. They, 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 they can literally be mm. the, the, the solar Arabia for Europe. Yeah, okay. But how to evacuate this sun? Because France is not willing mm. to build interconnection with Spain. Mm. Because France is not seeing its interest. It shouldn't be a French interest. It should be a European one. This has to be yes. arranged, yeah. to be looked at and to be met working. Yeah, and then of course there's the sort of political aspect of it all as well, on which energy sources do we use. I mean, you and I come from countries which have heavily invested into nuclear power. So do countries that are anti-nuclear want to then use that in their own, own grids as well? I, I think that's one of the big questions that, that we have. I do not know Finland much. I know France a little bit more. It's very unfortunate that we have a civil war on nuclear, wind, and solar. It does not make any sense, but that's what we have. So people favoring nuclear does not want to move a finger for solar and wind. People favoring wind are not much interested in solar. People interested in solar are a bit alone. <laughs> they have to do on their own, but, but they do not get necessarily the support they, they, they should need. And so, it's a bit, uh, in my country, it's a bit ridiculous for the yeah. moment. And to a certain extent, the crazy thing is that we actually need all of them in one yeah. way or another. And if there is this sort of adamant opposition to one, then that also means that the technology in the area doesn't develop. And I think nuclear is a good example of that. Whether you like it or not, yes, it has been developed, but since the 1970s, it hasn't exactly been the sort of sexy form of energy, if you know what I mean. Now, if we look beyond our old navel, in other words, beyond Europe, uh, what, what kind of implications do you see uh, this war having in the energy sector on the rest of the world? Because, of course, we are looking at this very much from a European perspective. From the rest of the world, I won't be optimistic. Mm. I think that forces being linked to fossil fuels have excellent arguments that anybody can buy to push their uh, their way and to ask for delay. Mm -hmm. And uh, this I don't like, but I think it, it's, it's more likely. And uh, maybe China will not do, because China is not good with fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. So they are good only with coal. They know that coal are killing themselves. Mm -hmm. And they know that with wind and solar, they can, they can kill less people with Chinese coal and uh, go ahead. Yeah. But even in China, they pushed a lot coal now, and, and more than, than they said one year ago. Yeah. And outside China, the 
solar and wind are pushed by themselves because uh, they are cheaper than many other way, but the fossil industry has, uh, has the hand yeah. on, on too many things. How about, I mean, I'm just back from Davos, World Economic Forum, right? Uh, not too many Chinese there, by the way, not too many Russians either, but a lot of our Indian friends as well, and th also a lot of our African friends. And, and the repeated argument that you hear from, towards us is to say that, listen, you polluted the world, you became industrial with pollution, and now you're asking us to tone down. What, what's your answer to that? It's not your fault. We know that, Jean-Michel, but... <laughs> we have to acknowledge that they are right. We polluted the world, yeah. we the Westerners, not them. Yeah. Do we have the willingness to help? Do we have the financing to help them? Not of use in our public opinion. Not of use that uh, these days our, uh, our citizens mm. in EU will be okay to help more. And I, I, I think they will prefer to delay more yeah. than to help more. Final question. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm born in the 1960s. I'm born 1968. So for me, the 1970s is a past memory. I've read about it, but you know, I wasn't exactly, how would I say, cognitively adult at the time. But I hear a lot of comparisons with the 1970s oil crisis energy crisis and today. Do, do you see those parallels or this, is this completely different? Are we going to see a sort of an explosion of energy prices? No, it's very different because of energy transition. Ah. We know, we know by heart with so many realities that we can do differently. We know that we can consume less. We see how much uh, oil we use in EU compared to US. So we have so many, many examples that it's absolutely sure that we can do everything differently. But the willingness is at, is at stake because uh, it's not because we know that we can do things differently that the citizens will be ready to do and that the businessmen will be convinced that it will work because we need both sides to to react. And uh, in these circumstances, the political will or the, the political policies, the, the, the political attitude can play a big role because businessmen want to be sure that we will not move from this path. And uh, consumers, if we are able to have half of the consumers, 60% of the consumers with us, it will work because uh, other consumers we can take on board by promising regulated prices, by promising support, and we can promise a lot because uh, in macroeconomic terms these days it's not stupid to support vulnerable consumers mm. or poor consumers mm. because we need people to consume. We don't want to see, like in China, uh, uh, demand being done by 10% or more. Mm. So if we can do this, so part of the population being against any change, they will not have any change. And people understanding that change are interesting or uh, attractive, they will get it. And then we have the better of the world. I don't think it is so difficult to do what it requires is from politicians to be able to dance on their two feet. We protect the one needed protection, mm. but we go ahead because the mm. uh, EU has to move and EU has to stay at the forefront of innovation, investment, changing the world. I think this is a very optimistic way of ending it as well. Realistic, I might add. So a lot realistic. of times. It's a lot of times it's about both politics and policy. And in yeah. that sense, we can grind ourselves through and not get into the same mess that we were in the 1970s. Yeah. Uh, Jean-Michel, it's been a pleasure to Mine, talk Alex. to you. Thank you for making us understand the war and its ramifications uh, much better, especially from a energy perspective. To all of our watchers and listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, about understanding the war and energy perspectives. 
feel free to follow us on YouTube. Uh, we are the School of Transnational Governance and the European University Institute in Florence. Thank you very much. See you soon again. The Russian army is committing barbaric actions.